leader in the MIT Media Lab. Um, tonight's topic is, is in particular is about um, designing computing support for activities that don't require and command our entire attention. So we're looking for at um, designing computing experiences to help us in the in our per, in the periphery of our work in the periphery of our uh, communications and you know uh, there's more here that we could pull out but I'm happy to hand the mic over to Ted Selker. <clears throat> Hi everyone and welcome. I'm Ted Selker. I am CTO of uh, Alfico, um, a company that uh, thinks about how to help people with their communication. Um, everybody can see me. Is that uh, this um, this slide? Yep. yep. And tonight I'm going to talk about peripheral computing. Um, it's uh, the goal of such as to um, you know make interfaces that blend with the world. And um, uh, this this is a sleeve I'll talk about a little later that that recognizes whether you're working out or, or whether you're dancing. Um, so there, we're getting to the point where, where we can recognize such things. Um, let's see, how do I go on there? Um, so peripheral computing uh, is a ter term I kind of been working with uh, some other people on and, and I kind of teased us in, in saying, hey, there's so many different kinds of computing. Ubiquitous computing is, is all the things around us that, uh, that, that uh, have computing in them and pervasive is, is um, IBM started to talking about it when they were talking about supporting all of these things with infrastructure. Ambient computing, I think of as things that are in space in, in the environment around us and, and have computing in them. The internet of things is such things that are online. Um, and peripheral computing I distinguish as being something that's not the primary focus. So the point is that you are um, that you are thinking about other things maybe than, than, than the specific thing that the computer cares about. Um, it might be that there's secondary perceptual and effector systems, that they're secondary to what you're doing or activities. Um, and the question is, are there other things that you are subconscious of, like that the ceiling might, might break and fall on you, that you know what you would do if it happened? Um, this particular picture shows a smart floor that I made in, a, in, a, this, in this case, it was in a museum exhibit. Um, there's a book that I edited with a couple of other friends, um, Peripheral Interaction. And um, it, it kind of goes into some of this stuff um, and the topics are, are there on, on the left. But the point of the whole idea is that interfaces have been very egocentric. Um, somehow they expect that we're gonna understand all the error codes they put back at us, that we're gonna pay attention to them. And it maybe worked a little bit well <laughs> with an office or a cubicle. Now we are literally using computers in every social circumstance we're involved with. And in that regard, maybe we have to really start realizing that, that the computer um, is not necessarily able to know when we're gonna be paying attention to it. Um, so the talk is gonna have these four parts. Um, I'm gonna talk about ubiquitous peripheral devices, pervasive, ambient, um, and I'm gonna end with how AI can support peripheral computing. Um, on the right, you see a picture of a screen from the Alfie app that I um, helped make. Uh, and it's really, uh, this, this particular page was our attempt to have a mirror. So while you're doing things that are probably advancing yourself in your career or whatever, it's, 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 it's giving you this way of seeing how well you're doing. So this is not what you're doing. It's, it's, ha um, it's, it's, also, it's, it's how, you're, how you look to yourself uh, are you kind, optimistic, ambitious, or brave, for example? Um, but I'm going to start by by showing examples of of uh, ubiquitous things. Here's me on uh, Good Morning America with Diane Sawyer, and she's noticing that there needs to be more salt in her pancake batter. So the idea of what I call um, advisory agents is ones that teach you. They don't do things for you, but they they help you understand. The environment you're working in. So by teaching you that you should put more salt in this as opposed to putting in salt for you, um, it's, it's doing that. And this one can sense all, it can sense gooiness and it can sense temperature and it can sense 
um, you know, uh, pressure. And so you can tell whether your eggs are getting, are getting stiff and things like that. So the idea is that this has these sensors, but it's literally chiming in on the side. Another example of something that um, one of my students did is he made a game where when you catch the ball, it measures your heart rate. And to the extent that your heart rate is going down, your, your team gets more points. So it's kind of a counterintuitive thing that makes it so, you know, you probably want to run around the field before you get the ball and then, uh, you know, have, have your, your team members keep you from getting tickled so that you can, you know, zen, zen in and, and, and lose, lose uh, heart rate um, as you go. So this is fun because it kind of gives you more understanding and access to um, a, a new kind of strategy, but also it's using, um, it's sensing something we usually aren't so aware of, that is our heart rate. Um, this is a, an example I got in uh, Bicycling Magazine at some point. Now there's starting to be things a little bit like it, but the point is that this mediates, this helmet mediates communication from the environment to us. So <clears throat> when you go over a, a bump, it will record that place and whatever you said about that place. If there was a pothole or if you fell or whatever the reason is, um, and if you scream uh, some obscenity, it covers up that with 130 decibel um, horn. And if you tip your head, it turns on blinkers. So the point is that it's kind of <clears throat> a little bit more command and control than, than what I think of mostly for these peripheral things, except that it's really allowing you to keep your eyes on the road and your hands on the wheel while you're driving. And that's kind of um, a different direction than a lot of the um, driving support things that we, that we think of. Um, being part of our world are. So this one is, is literally um, trying to integrate your, your work, um, uh, be helpful to you without taking your attention away from what you're doing. Um, this is something called IR. And IR is about identity, but it used infrared um, to look at your eye with one sensor. And what I loved about this is we were able to, with one sensor, recognize <clears throat> um, uh, what with context, whether you were winking or blinking or staring or gazing or eyes were opened or closed. And what it did is if you looked at a demo and you showed interest in it, it would email you that demo. If you looked at another person and you showed interest in them by, by staring at them a little, a little bit, it would send their email, uh, you, um, it'd send them your email so that they could get in touch with it if they wanted to. So the point is that by, by really thinking hard about the context um, and using very simple sensors, sometimes we can do things where we can bring extra information, extra function um, to bear on a situation. Um, this is that sleeve I was wearing earlier, and it has uh, some gesture recognition, so it can tell if you're if you're lifting weights and count your repetitions. Watch if you're dancing, uh, tell if you're fidgeting, and try to do appropriate things with with the lights and maybe by counting. Um, so the point is using um, an extra sensor, but, um, but fitting into the environment and not changing what you're doing. Um, so I wanna talk now about pervasive computing. So it's, this is stuff that's, that's built into the environment. In the environment, we could have this, this floor I built where this floor literally can tell what the configuration of people is around the room. And if there's a person over there, it might make some little steps over to them to try to introduce the two of us. If I'm the only person in one place and everybody else is somewhere else, it turns the spotlight on me and lets me give my lecture. Um, if I walk to a part of the lab and nobody's there, but there's a demo there, it, it'll run the demo for me. So maybe it'll even find my keys. I mean, this is not looking far-fetched anymore, but the idea of a sensing floor can do a lot of things, work in different scenarios and, um, anticipate our, our needs a little bit. Um, we made a, a, a vending machine. Um, and the point of the vending machine is, is maybe, maybe the most important thing about a vending machine is that it's gonna sell um, the soda, but the way we get people interested in it is as you walk up to it, this vending machine um, <clears throat> lets, uh, makes, makes a game for you to play and it can tell how many people are in front of it. And um, so engages you um, and um, maybe when you're when you're far away from it, it, it actually puts up uh, some of the news or or what what um, what gates the different airplanes are at. So we tried all of these things, but the point is that that um, we're really trying to use uh, have a, a uh, an interface that is um, uh, 
engaging you not with the primary task, but with something else that will in the, eventually actually support the primary task because people actually find vending machines that are just glaring at you saying they're Pepsi, 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 a little bit off-putting. Uh, we, we made a bunch of explorations in kitchens where um, one of the most interesting things about this kitchen that we learned was if that uh, picture of what's in the refrigerator is always on the refrigerator, people didn't pay to attention to it much. But if when you walk towards the refrigerator, it shows a picture of what's inside the refrigerator, people opened it less often. If when you open the freezer, uh, it looked like a snowstorm, um, you close the freezer much quicker. A um, little wind blowing, you get goosebumps. It was kind of fun. Um, and, and within that kitchen, we had a, a smart sink. And one of the fun things about that smart sink uh, that Kaiser was interested in at one point was um, if you washed your hands, uh, the camera would notice. And then um, if you washed them long enough, it would let the door close to the examining room. So the examining room became an examining room when you when you uh, exhibited the correct behavior that you as a practitioner should do before examining a person. It also did things like if you put um, a pot under the sink, it put in hot water. If you put uh, vegetables under it, it put cold water. If you put your hands under it, make water, warm water to wash them. So it was trying to be context aware, but using this extra these extra sensors to change the way that um, this environment acts towards you. Um, we made a lot of uh, office furniture where the wall um, was painted with, uh, with what, what looks like a desktop, really. And what you do is you take a tablet and you point at that, that window and you'd be looking at the web or you'd point at those, the, the, the calendar on the wall and you'd be looking at a, at a, um, at a, at a, um, uh, a much more detailed view of the calendar. So what's on the wall is not, uh, is low resolution but what's in front of you is high resolution. So this is the idea of bringing things in the peripheral vision up to you, making that desktop metaphor literally be that any room you want, you can paint with to be any kind of office you want. So the physical things in our offices are not so important anymore, but the idea of placing things spatially, method of loci tells us and many other things tell us is still a valuable thing. This is actually the table. It actually went to the Olympics to show off these ideas but that's another story. Um, so one of the more complicated things we built was something that when uh, you're getting doing physical therapy, it would notice um, <clears throat> uh, whether people were distracting you or not, whether they were helping you or not, um, and be aware of how to give you some feedback, uh, some candy if you did a good job. Um, and so this really integrated all of these different devices to support somebody in physical therapy, um, counting their reps and, and, and so on, and treating um, you know, the doctor that walks in and is trying to help you differently than your, than your aunt that's ringing you about the, the loan you haven't paid back to her or whatever is distracting you from, from uh, your physical therapy at the moment. So this idea of pervasive computing um, <clears throat> uh, is kind of things in the, in, in the environment. Ambient um, computing, is things all around us. And so here I am um, in, in a bed, um, again, on Good Morning America. And what happens is if I close my eyes, the, ce the ceiling kind of goes quiet. If, I, if I'm looking drowsy, it puts, it puts stars up in the, uh, in the sky. If I, if I wake up in the morning, my eyes are open, it turns off the alarm. And, and so I can actually make selections, play games, read email and stuff, just using eye tracking while laying in bed. And it's kind of a fun thing because laying in bed, you've got a nice stable support for your head. It works much better, actually, than a lot of other places that we could use eye tracking. Um, but the, yeah, and so um, the, the actual, um, you know, question that we come to is, as we're building these, this world where, where things in the periphery um, do things with us um, and come to our forefront when, when appropriate, uh, the question is, where, how, how are we going to, how are we going to understand um, and take care of those problems? So here are some AI examples that I that I'm really um, uh, proud of. Um, this is a, an early one where we tried all sorts of sensors, like you know galvanic skin response and stuff. And what we found is that the best way to tell what Andrea Lockhart was doing when she was taking videos, she was uh, walking around Red Square. I mean. <laughs> uh, 
near the near Harvard Square, um, where the red line comes through, and and she was videotaping people <clears throat> and things. And what we discovered was when she giggled while she was taking the videos, that was the indication that she was interested in the video. And so one time during the hour when she was videoing, um, there she was videotaping somebody, videotaping her. That was kind of funny. Another time she was videotaping um, some people playing drums on on uh, pots and pans uh, near the subway entrance. Um, and and uh, you know there was a couple of other times. And so this thing can do automatic editing by recognizing this um, this other kind of sensor than 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 you would you know not, nothing you you have to press on um, uh, explicitly but rather implicit communication that is afforded by by her actions. Um, so the question is when 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 can AI be considerate? Um, and you know when I'm when I'm talking or doing or thinking, um, you know, um, should it be paying attention uh, or it should be letting me uh, focus on talking and doing and thinking? Um, you know, what are the rules for social engagement? The fact is now when we're using everything in a social um, setting with these phones, uh, these supercomputers that are out there in the world with us, um, actually, when they communicate to us, they should be paying attention to the social uh, rules of engagement because to the extent that they break those rules, they're going to distract us deeply uh, because we uh, don't work very well when when things um, are inappropriate. Um, and maybe they have to be a little bit more affirming. Maybe they have to be more listening. Um, and <clears throat> uh, what what is this whole question of a peripheral anyway? So there's a million things that could happen in my environment around me, and I'm still able to focus on giving this talk. I mean, what if what if a, a deer were to crash through the window, you know, into this room? I would probably, you know, shoo it out. Uh, but but I wouldn't. And and in I have all sorts of you know subroutines, things that I know what to do about that could um, that could solve various problems. But I'm not thinking about them at all. I'm just thinking about what my what my engagement is right now. And, and I'll, I'll deal with them when they come up. Um, and the question is that, you know, social success requires appropriate responses. And that's the why. So one of the early things we did um, was um, made something called Disruption Manager. And Disruption Manager, uh, Ernesto Arroyo made, where uh, basically you're sitting there and this background behind these two red boxes is a desktop where you were getting orders that were being taken that you were supposed to take and you were getting emails about about these orders and you were getting you had a spreadsheet you had to fill out about it and you had a calculator you had to use to to find out the amount that you were going to charge a customer and then and you get text messages that were social or maybe from your boss and what we found was when we <clears throat> were um using ai to uh, mediate uh, these communications, uh, we got a 25% performance in, uh, in increase. Let me explain what I, what I mean. So what happened is we had a model of disruption. So if, you're, uh, if a message comes in and it's about the thing you're doing right now, it comes right through. If, it's, um, if you're busy typing or talking to somebody, uh, it might be delayed. If it is similar to another message that's being delayed, it might be grouped with that one. If it is higher priority than one that's being waited on, it might go forward. So just by um, automatically um, delaying them up to two minutes um, and, and organizing them relative to the tasks you were working on, we were able to make an AI system that could um, uh, increase your performance. That means you, you, made, you took a lot more orders. Or if we said, don't, don't worry about taking a lot of orders, just make your orders perfect and never make a mistake. It reduced the, um, the, the amount of errors people made by about that much too. And we actually put um, a disruption manager on the text messaging for uh, kids at Wellesley for a little bit. And um, they hated it when we turned it off. <laughs> that was kind of fun. So uh, don't have the statistics on that right here. 
Um, so that that's kind of an interesting idea is that maybe maybe things shouldn't come through all the time. Maybe they should come through when they're appropriate. Um, and so what is this business of, of um, social social actors? So the idea is that when you're when you're communicating, um, there's a lot of things that communicate um, what what who what what you are communicating that are separate from the text you're you're giving or the or the you know the yeah the the um the language you're using you know there's the there's your mutual gaze there's your, you know how close you're sitting to the person there's the uh the gesturing you're doing um and basically um there's you know what what i'm looking towards is a time when the computers are aware of your social uh commitments and uh, limitations to allow it to not be making social blunders. So, you know, what, what should we do when we have uh, an opportunity to, um, to communicate with a person for a computer? We want to recognize that, you know, uh, we have to inform and negotiate relationships. What does that mean when a computer's informing and negotiating? It's kind of like that that thing I just told you. It's it's really deciding uh, when it's inappropriate for it to communicate with the person, maybe. Um, and the question is, what is appropriate social feedback? Is it uh, a, um, as in this Tesla that I was driving the other day when it just kept beeping and beeping and beeping, and, it, and I, there was no way to find out what the beeping is? That's not that's not appropriate. It has to it it has to be discoverable. It has to be a able to explain itself it, you know i mean if the car is sick it should, i should be able to find out why it's sick or what it means to be sick or say i don't care if you're sick stop stop belly aching but but that is not negotiating when it when it's uh you know refuses to change any of that and really the question is to re reduce cognitive and affective load we have to think about what is pertinent and valuable to communicate uh we want to do it in a thoughtful and caring way and we want it to be uh, receptive and reciprocal. We don't want it to be distracting. We don't want it to be disruptive. We don't want it to be condescending, which most computer interfaces like that beeping of the of the darn beeping. I mean, it's the it's the least informative and most annoying thing it could do um, that my Tesla was doing. Um, and it, we don't want it to be hostile or manipulative. Um, stop, you know, putting a big blap. I mean, I, an awful lot of web pages just put a blap. Up in front of you while while you're while you're trying to load a, a web page these days, and it's 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 not new. I mean, they've been there've been lots of hostile and uh, manipulative things that that um, uh, computers have done over the years. So one of the um, ways we kind of explored this re reducing social mistakes was with some uh, experiments about collaboration. So now we're thinking about using uh, AI to help human human communication not just human computer in, uh, communication. And in one experiment, <clears throat> we, we, uh, we thought about all of the ways that um, people make mistakes when they are, um, when they are uh, collaborating. And the ones that are highlighted, those are the ones that we um, thought we could do something about. A uh, meeting was not too well facilitated, too much extraneous noise um, and so on. And so here's some experiments that we did to, exp uh, to explore that. And this is Raoul Rajan's uh, PhD thesis. Um, and what we did is, in one example, we had <clears throat> these this chess game, and we're very close to the end of the chess game. It's kind of a, a check or checkmate situation, and we have these people discussing what 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 you know they're they're on one side. I think they got you know they're 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 black or something, and and you can see that this green line here is because one of the people is dominating the conversation, and what we say to that person is turn taking turn taking, and when we say that. You see him, his his domination or hers plummets, and I say that because it, there was a, this is statistically significant. We had um, you know twelve groups of people do this, and what they and what what happened is their contribution reduced, and the people that were not speaking any thoughts we said that to them, and they started contributing. They went from zero up to 30, 40 percent, and what was nice is that their community, their collaboration well it dropped off a little bit they continued to be part of a collaboration as opposed to being uh, completely dominated by this person that was that was thought they had the idea of, of, of how to fix this chess thing. Um, we, we tried other things. We tried when uh, the noise, when there was noise in the background, we tried having either um, 
um, the person has say, hey, you know, uh, could you turn turn down the microphone? Um, or we had the computer say it and noisy. When it said noisy, instead of having a person say it, um, basically they had half the communication errors. This is in a game where they were supposed to be um, playing hangman and deciding what what letter to put next in the hangman effort. Um, we did another experiment um, relative to these problems people have, uh, you know, um, um, with with collaboration, where we wanted to see um, how do you how do you um, evaluate who's here, and um, you know, a typical um, uh, John has entered the meeting. You know, typical telephone conferencing systems. You've probably heard them say things like that before, and I thought, oh, wouldn't it be great if instead we had an iconic. A kind of an uh, ear icon kind of thing where we had a door slam and the person's name that, that had come in through the door and we tried that and <clears throat> John, it was no better. Um, the error rates of who was in the meeting was was not really any statistically better. But when we tried a metaphor uh, of leaving or entering being a statement or a question, we got half the number of errors. And let me let me play you what that sounds like. Here's Ted coming in. John. Or John. And here's him leaving. John. It's just a little question mark at the end. And that little question mark at the end, um, people interpreted very easily. It was less disruptive is what I believe is the reason. Um, and um, and, and they, they were able to get lower errors. So anyway, we did a bunch of these things. And, um, and I'm, you know, going through them because they're just kind of a little bit... Um, I'm not going to bother with that one. They're a little bit counterintuitive, and there's some papers about them. You can find them on my Vita on my website if you want. Now, <clears throat> um, some of what we did with these ideas is we, we said, well, what would it be like in a co uh, video conferencing system? And so we made uh, this thing. I made this thing. I started a little company that is now um, not doing very much um, that, that um, watches people while they're, while they're in a conference call. And what we did is when we have a little AI that's going along and, and uh, noticing um, if one person's speaking a lot and giving some of that feedback we talked about on the last slide, that when, uh, when, when, when they're speaking too much, uh, making them aware when there's noise in the background, making them aware when they aren't contributing in a way that'll help them take, take charge. But also it gives this, this, uh, this bars and these bars show you that this, purple guy has been speaking for a little bit and before him there was the green and purple guy talking at the same time and earlier um the green person got a chance to to speak a little bit but you can see how the, there's a there's a progression of the conversation where the the green person spoke a bunch at the beginning and now the purple guy is getting to speak so it's giving you a a feeling for the whole the whole meetings um uh, direction. If you guys want to play with it, go to c3.chat. It's yet another video conferencing system. I'm not sure that anybody wants to try another one these days, but it's it's fun because it uses these con considerate systems um, and these peripheral cues to try to make people aware of some of the communication styles um, and and uh, that they have and to improve them based on some of the statistically significant research that we've done. So Another thing that we did at MIT is we had this um, empathy buddy, we called it, and it's, uh, there's a nice paper about it that, that people thought was good. And what was interesting is we, we had a little, um, we used um, common sense reasoning um, to, to recognize something about what was being written. And the last thing a person says, I went skydiving last uh, Saturday outside New York, and it looked surprised. And what we found was when we used a pictogram that showed that the person was surprised instead of text, that they were much more um, likely to change their email. And so that became uh, very interesting to us. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Another thing that we did is we made an email system that <clears throat> I'm quite proud of because what happened is we made a big mistake. The things that were urgent, uh, we marked as orange, and the things that were not so urgent, we marked as green. Um, people um, responded more to the ones that were urgent. But I was realizing later, maybe I should have colored the things that you want to work on as green and the things you don't want to work on as red. So what I really enjoy about that statement is this idea that actually 
getting the UI perfect wasn't as important as making people aware of urgency of an email. So we we had a little AI that would say, okay, this is this is somebody that you you speak you respond to all the time. Uh, this is a brand new person you're just being introduced to. This is uh, just a normal conversation that you have. We have we have some classifications. We did some machine learning to to establish. But I really want to underscore this idea that sometimes the point of the user interface is things being distinguishable and people understanding them. And what was especially interesting about this email example, too, is that <clears throat> our machine learning wasn't perfect. And so we were only <laughs> under 70% correct about whether something was urgent uh, or not. And still people um, um, were better at making their decisions about which they looked at the same number of emails as in a normal uh, normal email system with, with uh, um, normal subject lines. But with this ransom note, um, interface, as I like to call it, they actually um, were better at choosing the ones that were important to them to select. So, so um, the question is: Is it, you know when is when is function more important than beauty? And and uh, and maybe we underestimate how well people are, uh, how good people are at 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 using whatever whatever we give to expose something important to them in an interface. So that's a kind of a cautionary table. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about um, some of the feedback uh, that's been given in various communication because the rest of this talk is about is about this um, issue of of how to um, help people with their communication uh, using AI. So back in the beginning, um, a guy named George Heidorn uh, made something called um, Pettit, and he underlined suggestions all over the text um, at, on IBM um, email systems. Um, uh, and and text editing systems, and uh, you know, improve people's writing. Um, and then along came um, you know Emacs and, uh, and Gmail with uh, things like text completion. Uh, text completion has been around for <laughs> since since the seventies, quite frankly, but it's gotten better. And what's happened is that when you're writing an email, <clears throat> unlike an advisory agent that that teaches you. Um, these ones that do text completion say, I could write the sentence better for you, or I could finish the sentence for you. And that's, and they're doing a masterful job in Gmail at doing that. I, I hope it makes people better at writing instead of worse. Um, another example uh, of something trying to give feedback for um, is, is Clippy. And what I, I found um, especially surprising about it was they somehow decided to have a wiggling off on the periphery. And the peripheral vision really is attracted to things that move. It also would often tell you what something was for, um, not how to solve the problem. And so what happened is you were working over here and Clippy would take your attention over to there and then it wouldn't solve a problem for you. And you know that it didn't, didn't do very well in the marketplace, even though it had some of the top sociologists in the world working on how to make the look and feel right. Um, it was breaking social norms. It was taking your attention away from what you wanted to be focusing on. And it wasn't sure enough that it was giving you a solution for you to, to for it, for you to really um, recognize whether you should bother looking over at it or not. Now, <clears throat> Coach was a system that actually, um, well, it was my PhD, and, and it was used in OS2 um, to highlight things that you were working on. So if you were doing something like installing a printer or or doing something complicated on the user interface, it would highlight and it used um, information that was on and near what you're doing to help you with it. And it would, and it used AI to decide whether it should help you with the novice, intermediate, professional, or expert level. And uh, people got five times uh, more done when they when we turned that thing on with these scrims that cover up the things that you shouldn't be paying attention to if you're a novice um, than if they didn't. By the way, if you clicked on any of them. It would bring up the script for and the, and the help for for the thing that would use those buttons. So uh, somehow it even ships today in this I don't know operating system that no one uses. Um, uh, but um, so more recently, and in fact right now, I'm working on something called Alpha Reflect, and we are are watching as you're um, doing your work, and we're. Um, watching um, the language you're using and trying to decide um, what 
um, another person might think of what you're saying. So let's go into that a little bit more. <clears throat> so this is um, an example of using um, Alfie Reflect uh, in this Alfie app, where um, if a person said men are dumber, it says inclusive, and it has this icon uh, that's a man and a woman. Um, and if um, <clears throat> you'd say, am I making sense? Um, it'll it'll um, put up a, a kind of a, a neutral look that says, is this clear? Um, and so you can reflect on whether you could make a simpler or more direct statement um, that then am I making sense? Because there's a bit of um, a diminishing nature to um, asking that question, am I making sense? Maybe you could say something more direct like, do you understand? Or do you need any more explanation? So this is something that works while you're typing and responds to you in the moment as you're typing, so that it's almost like somebody you're, you're talking to was giving you um, the, the facial uh, feedback that we are used to getting when we're, when we're talking to another person. That's the image that I like to think of is that um, we are very used to feedback. And uh, one place that uh, we, 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 we find that is in something called side tone. So on telephones, they found out a long time ago that if they had, um, some of your voice mixed into the earpiece. You could tell that you were being that your that your voice was being um, listened to by the by the telephone. And when they take that out, people speak much louder. They um, also um, get a little more strident. And so this idea of a visual side tone, uh, a communication side tone that is giving you a little feedback about what somebody else might hear uh, in your voice, uh, is what this AI is doing. So, you know, a lot of people like Grammarly um, work on legibility um, and they'll, they'll do this great stuff. Um, uh oh, what happened? Oh, phew. Um, you know, like point out misspellings or um, grammatical problems and it's very subtle and people, many people love it very much. But um, there's a lot of literature that says that the tone of your communication is actually, you know, a large part of your communication. And so, you know, we um, respond if you say something like, this is great, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a smiley thing. If we say, uh, if we, um, it's perfect way to think about this, that's, that's, that's noticing that it's deferential, that you're um, saying something uh, nice to, um, about, about the um, way people are talking about that. And uh, the semantics are important. Is this, this is a hot topic. Um, is a response that is going to give, um, in some situations, with, with a smile, uh, gives a smile, a, a, a mild positive um, thing, because there's not really anything um, feedback that will that will make it better in in our in our view. So it's really been an interesting journey. Um, we started off, you know, saying we're going to get beyond shame, blame, and complaint, uh, and so we're going to. So our first feedback. Um, were things like this, this icon that, you know, looks grumpy and he says too edgy when, when the person said women are not inspiring, uh, or it said women are not intelligent. It's a really, it's this grump, grump again. Women are not haters. Have you thought this through? And these are all kind of very, they're criticism, right? And um, so what happened after, after um, 13 rounds of feedback design as we got to something better. By the way, along the way, at one point, we were going to try to have inclusion be these two heads on these platters. <laughs> I mean, it was supposed to be the women and men are balanced. But, you know, if you look at that, that's pretty, pretty gruesome uh, image that we came up with. Uh, so it's, it's often important uh, to, to uh, when, when you're making, uh, when you go to the icon factory, coming out uh, uh, with with somebody else looking at your your work and making sure that you aren't doing something really stupid. Um, so this, you know, now we're using this 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 inclusive men and uh, women thing for sexism. We're using an old and a young woman holding hands for ageism. We're using um, a very simple um, uh, you know um, image for 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 um, for when things are neutral. Um, that you know, as you can imagine, makes it a lot easier to look at these things. Um, to give you, an, you know, an, an image of what <clears throat> what it looks like in Gmail, 
um, here you are typing along and um, you know, there's something wrong with uh, um, this, this, there's an Aegis thing going on up here. And down here, there's um, um, an apology that a person's made. So, you know, um, that's, that's kind of not, not as, uh, not as, um, not, not so good to be always making apologies. Um, and, you know, one of, yeah, and so that's, that's kind of uh, uh, an example of, of, of what you might see in Gmail. Um, we've played around with it for video conferencing. And so if you, somebody says, you know, something that's, you know, racist or sexist or ageist or something like that, um, it might put up a little icon in, uh, in front of their, their, their um, image that makes them kind of try to think about it so that they um, recognize that they're maybe being a little bit um, uh, scary to the people that they're talking to. Um, and, and in that way, maybe they'll soften their communication. Because in this case, where I'm talking to you guys, I, I actually am not hearing back from any of the 10 or 12 people that are in this meeting. Although I'd be happy to, and I look forward to to hearing from you guys soon. So when we were building this thing, um, <clears throat> we we started off with. Let me, in fact, see. Yeah. So we started off with um, trying to distinguish tone with matching words. You know. Um, you know. Sorry. Sorry um, seemed like always about apology, except it isn't, because we often say sorry for your loss, and so direct word matching is not a great way to go. Some people uh, use direct ma matching today, even in call center uh, um, things and in looking for um, bad, bad information in, in communication on, on social media. Um, we also tried repurposing some of the fancy AI tools out there. We tried uh, to think about, you know, um, things like Spacey and Hugging Face. Um, they have pre-trained uh, models around some of the topics that one would imagine, like hate. Um, and um, the, the, what happened to us is we found that, um, first of all, using uh, several language models, um, these large language models that other people had trained, um, if you use a bunch of them, you start having a lot of lag. But also what we found is that the way they'd imagined uh, hate being used wasn't the way we did. And so we started giving it a few examples with one, something called one-shot learning. But one shot learning had a trouble with nuance. And so in the end, we are doing what we are calling multi label um, training with large language models like BERT is what we're using right now. Um, and using these training models to make fine grained um, proprietary, but um, a communication um, evaluation that, that really is starting to make a big difference. In, in, in fact, the way I'm communicating. So when I'm using my tools, I'm getting better now. Uh, and all the people that are working on it are, 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 are seeing their, 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 their communication styles changing. So very, very excited about that. Um, and what you see here is this is kind of the sausage. Um, so, um, you know, we tried to start doing this ensemble, what's called ensemble learning. And um, this is, you know, a bunch of the different things we were tra uh, set training sentences. And here's some of the things we're training for, ageism, sexism, racism, and so on, positive, deferential. Um, and so, you know, starting out, we were looking through all of these and deciding how, how good we were at, um, at evaluating each of these things. And, and in the end, what you end up doing once you have a big ensemble learning system is you have to combine all of the different things and the ones that are, that are, that are winning, you know, the, the one, you know, it thinks that it's, it's hate and not racism or something, that one has to win and decide that it's time for it to say something to the user. And it also has to be a time that the person's ready to listen to be listened to by the user. And so there's something called a blackboard system, which is a, it's really a conflict resolution approach that, that AI has been using for a long time to, to have a lot of knowledge experts decide. And much more modern systems use voting between different uh, machine learning models, um, and more sophisticated approaches like Bayesian nets that go into different states along the way. So we've been playing with all sorts of ways of combining multiple kinds of AIs to, to decide when it's appropriate and what to say to a person to support their communication. <clears throat> so what are the, what are the principles uh, that you'd wanna have for, for when, to, when to say things? Well, you have to know enough to comment. You have to be, uh, you wanna be affirming, 
Uh, you don't want to be, you want to be ambiguous enough that the person doesn't get angry. Um, you don't want to be negative. That just gets people, well, they feel, feel insulted. You want to be short, simple, and timely, non-distracting uh, visually or auditorially. And you don't want to, I say, I don't like putting words in people's mouths. So that's this idea of this advisory agent that's teaching you instead of the assistant, the, the, uh, um, the, um, the um, assistive assistant, the assistive agent uh, that is driving the car for you into a, into a white wall of some sort. So, um, and, and the really question is, if it does things for you, um, does it lose subtlety? And does it stop you from thinking if you are delegating? Um, and does it disturb you? Does it get you off topic? Um, and then the real question I like to think about is agency. I want people to feel personal responsibility and have um, agency. So I go back to this idea of side tone that I was talking about earlier. And um, I go back to talking about, uh, you know, this is being, a, you know, we're taking our, uh, us towards a path for peripheral um, computing. Um, and I have, um, you know, shown you some of my um, explorations into this. Um, and there's been more. And there's, of course, this book and the workshop and a journal. You can go read more about it. Or, or maybe just, you know, this, this talks enough. Um, and um, just, just to say that I believe that um, as computers mature, they're going to be more socially appropriate and they're going to be, um, you know, more in the background and letting us be people and letting us grow and learn together because we care only about each other and they have to be socially appropriate to us for us to be socially appropriate to each other. So thank you for that. Um, and that's my, my, my discussion this evening about peripheral computing, and I'm welcome any questions. Okay, I don't hear anybody else. I hope people heard my talk. I see. Okay, Nancy, hello. Sorry, hearing him. I see clapping for your talk from several people. Good, we like clapping. Right, and maybe Carl, since you were the first one who's clapped, I noticed you have a comment about it, the talk or a question for Ted. Uh, let's take someone else first. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay. Uh, RV, uh, uh, you want to jump in? Randall. Okay. I, I can go on something. Um, so uh, I, I, I really like your uh, emphasis on uh, computers being advisors uh, rather than sort of directing things uh, uh, and, and correcting people. Um, one of the questions that I had, uh, I, I, it's occurred to me as well that um, that pretty is often not as important as something that people can get their hands around and make sense of. In practice, have you managed to convince anybody who sells something of that? And, and if so, how, how do you do it? <laughs> well, I've been part of making many products. Um, and, you know, it's funny because uh, some, I, I tend to only like to work on things that are a little bit controversial um, or, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't happen without my in, in, in intervention. And I mean, you know, I, I say the track point is that example. Um, not only does it have a cognitive model in it, by the way, but it's sitting in the fricking middle of your keyboard. I mean, who would ever let you put a new device in the middle of a keyboard? And, you know, by showing that it made a 30% uh, uh, improvement in how fast you could do text editing while, um, while um, using your mouse um, and, and that it, you know, uh, had advantages over other pointing devices, um, you know, um, I got it in. It took years, by the way, <laughs> um, but it ain't, I mean, I would, I, I, in fact, when I first made it, I made it completely the color of the keyboard. So it didn't even stand out. And a man named Richard Sapper, a famous designer, he said, make it red. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so scared. You know, it's already, I'm already embarrassed about it being there. Um, but, you know, I mean, the thing that people complain about with the track point is not that it's sitting in the middle of the keyboard, although that is something that you would imagine would be a, a disaster. 
I don't know if that's an example enough for you. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess if if it if it's got evidence evidence to point to it, then that's hopefully well, enough. Yeah, the evidence is amazing. <laughs> Billions of dollars. You know, that was the good part. Yes. <laughs> helps. Thank you. Well, I, I will just chime in and say that my pointing device is my foot. Um, I do uh, all of my uh, mousing and clicking with my feet, not with my hands. Um, and it, work, it works remarkably well. Um, but my question is, um, who's funding all of this research? I mean, it sounds like interesting stuff to know, but who's putting dollars into finding these things out? Well, I mean, I, I, I taught at MIT Media Lab for 10 years, and that was a lot of sponsors. Um, many of them found it exciting. I mean, um, Steelcase was a, a group that was very enthusiastic, for example. Herman Miller was also... Uh, Motorola, Lear, um, um, British Telecom, um, um, uh, Microsoft, uh, et cetera. So that, that, you know, that hasn't been, uh, that, that's been, that's been good. Um, at Carnegie Mellon, uh, my, my funders were um, in, uh, industrial often also, um, you know, Samsung, uh, Ericsson. Um, now I'm doing this work at, um, uh, Alfico. So this startup is actually um, my patron. I'm very, very proud of working for being the CTO of, of Alfico. So there's a variety of ways of, of, of getting things funded. But I mean, your point is maybe the stuff seems too far out. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I actually think that the stuff is all very actionable. And, uh, and I, I wish I was doing more, more, more activity with more of you uh, to make these things into products. Jump in there, Kevin. Come off mute. Hi. Uh, so I really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. I think the pressure is going to be, so I really like the idea of kind of a, a benevolent assistant that's going to be there to, to you know, make suggestions and, and assist me, right? The, the difficulty is gonna be, there's gonna be a lot of pressure to monetize that. And there's gonna be a lot of pressure to um, have suggestions. Oh, Kevin, have you thought of, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I, I just wanna raise that because that's a fact of the, the tech world we live in and you know, obviously, I'm interested in hearing any thoughts you may have on that. Well, I think that's that's what we think of as true. But the best, I mean, I, I worked with a couple of different sales guys over the years selling some of the technology that I that I made at IBM that made, made you know, that was valuable. And uh, the first one was this guy that had like, he'd throw his Lexus keys down on the table. He'd strut around. He was big and, and brash. We made no sales. Uh, the second one was this guy who would sit there and say nothing. And during the conversation, when the customer would say something they were interested in, he said, could I write that down for later? And at the end of the meeting, having listened and been considerate, a contract would get written and we'd make money. So I actually think the opposite. I think that there's huge money to be made in being considerate and being uh, and standing back and recognizing when it's socially appropriate to communicate and what what you can do that's that's supporting the person you're trying to communicate with, because when people don't feel supported, they actually don't get engaged. How about that? Do you have a five? Do you want to? You have. Do you have. You probably have a comeback. Well, so I, I mean, I don't disagree with that, uh, but my I guess what I'm saying is, uh, with anything's like with anything like this, so. I mean, so an example, obviously, is, is, you know, you surf the web, right? And you see all kinds of suggestions for, for things. And, and there's just kind of a, there's, my only point is, and I hope you're right, but my only point is there will be a lot of pressure on efforts like this to, you know, inject certain yeah. things. I, I get it. So I'll give you the other, another, an example of that particular one. So I, I, I met these kids and, you know, Larry and Sergey and, and, and everybody else was like, you know, Yahoo and Alta Vista were like putting advertisements all over their screens when they did these searches. 
And, and Larry and Sergey said, you know, I, I wonder if we could just put the simple facts up, if that might be more interesting to people than, than blaring at them with all this, with that advertisement. Now it's 20 years in and, and they've, you know, there's more advertising, you know, creeping in all over the place, all over their, their website. But at the beginning, that really was their differentiator is that they were somebody, they were not uh, forcing you, pressing you, uh, but rather uh, letting you have agency. And there's still some of that. They're still better at that than, than some of these more blaring um, websites that I, that I can think of. Um, so I, I, I think that they might do better if they backed off a little bit, actually. Um, you know, I think it'd be interesting to figure out how. I hope you're right. Yeah, well, let's work towards it. Now, Harvey, I saw you had raised your hand at one point. Wait a minute, there's two raised hands. We like raised Lisa, hands. Lisa and Carl both have their hands raised. You want to come in and I say go? Hello. Can I go? Hey, Lisa. Lisa. Hi, hi, Ted. Um, thank you for this. I, I really enjoyed this. Um, okay. uh, two, two things. One is, um, I'm wondering whether, do you did you do any research at all on uh, how pe the people people who have used this uh, were their communication and you know what they were like with other people were affected when they're not on a computer you know like yeah you get it right okay well, there's a bunch of stuff question. right one would like longitudinal studies right and uh, mm -hmm. you'd like to, you'd like to follow uh, follow uh, whether whether the, whether it was a fun fun thing and it had trailed off or whether they got better and better at it. Um, and, you know, anecdotally, I'm getting better and back to this person that said, who funds this? Um, you know, in a startup, we can't do all of the research we'd like to do. Uh, we got to get a product out. But I think this is, a, um, you know, the really, the really the big goal, and it, it started early in my career, was um, when I <clears throat> was um, with my first help system, um, when, when we had the same help information given to people um, with an AI that did it appropriately and at the level that was right for them, um, the people um, liked the help system better, same help in, presented in the same exact way, liked the language they were writing in better um, and um, you know, uh, did better on post tests about programming and produced five times more exercises. So, yeah, there's, there's, um, now, does that say that that's going to last? Well, the thing that did last is that they um, learned things. In other words, there it wasn't just that they produced more exercises, but rather that they were actually able to answer questions better about the, the programming skills that they'd been picking up. And at that time, it was especially exciting to me because people back then really believed, and it can happen, that putting AI uh, responders in in systems can be brittle, annoying, in your face, disrespectful. But um, I achieved doing the opposite in that in that in that um, in that system. Coach was the name of it. So, do you think that, uh, for example, uh, if somebody were autist autistic, like an autistic user, would this be helpful in teaching? some you know yeah helping with social yeah. skills yeah i mean social skills i actually um i actually uh, had a student a master student um uh who was making a system for teaching autistics um kathy blocker was her name and um i i think it's a very complicated thing teaching autistic people i mean it's so funny when we first started when kathy started working first she said oh i'm going to use seinfeld examples and i was like the subtlety and complexity of those social situations is insane, right? That's why that's why they're so interesting to watch. So you know, back down to a smiley face kind of thing. Um, yeah, teaching teaching autistics. I don't know if you've ever done it, but I have, and it's a very complicated thing. And I don't know um, if we have good solutions uh, that are automatable uh, yet. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. 
I guess I, well, I'll, I'll say one more thing that's really interesting to me about this is when you are teaching an autistic person, I don't know how many of you guys have done this. Um, it is so difficult not to react to them with frustration because they are, they are responding with socially inappropriate uh, cues. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe the computer will be more patient, um, you know, if we program it to be. Um, and, and even if it was a support for the person that's communicating with an autistic person to make them somehow remember mm -hmm. to, to ignore the, the antisocial behavior, um, it would be amazing because even parents uh, have are pretty much, it's very, very difficult to learn mm -hmm. to, to respond to a person that's socially inappropriate without uh, judgment. True. We had Carl. Uh, Carl. Carl's been waiting patiently. Oh, good. Hi. Uh, sorry, you caught me uh, snacking there. So. Oh. <laughs> That's, um, Do I get some? <laughs> <laughs> um, so recently, was reading an article talking about uh, intergenerational communication problems that are occurring. You know, for instance, and how texting is used, or emojis, and all such. You know, I didn't know if you thought a little bit about how to perhaps bridge that gap or, or, you know, kind of smooth over the rough edges between, between those. Uh... There are so many things there. Some of the things we are absolutely on, uh, you know, one of the things I say about ageism is they don't give you a to they don't give you the big toys until you're, until you're 30 and then they take them away again when you're 52. So, um, you know, the, the generational things are, 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 are very complex. Within a family, of course, there's weaning and there's 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 puberty and people want to get away from their parents. So that's just part of being a human animal, I think. Um, and so that's hard to bridge, um, although some people do. Um, and then there's the question of, you know, language, right? And do we share a language? Uh, do we share goals? Do we share uh, activities? Um, and, you know, um, all of those are ripe places to, to work in that intergenerational um, support um and i'm sure there's i mean there's industries that can be created around that i think and yes is the answer yes yes this kind of technology i think should be should be part of that carl i saw the i probably the same article you were looking at or some version of it and I think some of these things are really interesting because the texting has become so ubiquitous and so um, so much of the fabric of our communication where we used to be voice all the time. And so you've got to find some mechanism. If texting is going to be this ubiquitous, you've got to find a mechanism to do what intonation does during speech, create breath groups, create uh, the speaker's attitude toward the comments that they're saying as part of the whole thing. And that's what the emojis and the differences in punctuation among the generations end up doing it and the different line lengths and all those things that they have been talking about and noticing. However, until somebody does the analytics, nobody knows why, you know, I'm so insulting to younger people because I'm just writing, you know, and I use ellipses, uh -huh. dot, dot, dot. And so what's the big deal? But of course, the meaning, the interpretation of those line lengths and ellipses and lack of or presence of emojis actually has very uh, distinct implications depending on your generation and yeah. how fluent an emoji you are, right? Yeah. I so think Edwin... That Edwin had a uh, hand up earlier. I don't know. If oh, that... I just want to say, I, I think that inspired me to actually write uh, some lyrics to a song and emojis. You know, apparently there's, you know, big things in trying to do movie titles and, and plots. And so. Yeah. Edwin, did you have your hand up earlier on purpose or not? Uh, let's see. That might have been the original um, raising hand okay. so or no. um, showing that this was interesting, but. Um, there what I had I did have a thought around your um your sleeve that could sense uh the of course the difference between um weights and let's say dancing but um 
along those lines, like what, one of the things that we've seen promise of perhaps, but maybe not um, you know, delivery is, is sort of like tr tracking like people as they're exercising for their form, right? And this might be, a, this might be more about wearables and how you might do slight corrective um, moments in as, I don't know, peripheral cues yep. uh, in that context, proper form for a squad. No, what's interesting, I think it's, a, yeah, it's it's a very, very interesting area. And I my first prototype of that, something like that was I actually did when I was at IBM in 1996 or seven. Um, but but um, now it's actually becoming an industry. Uh, you can buy mm -hmm. these these mirrors and work out in front of them. And they do try uh, to some, some, some ways to do some of this things you're talking about. And they, yeah. I hope they, they get better at this too. And certainly, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think it's a big, ripe, fascinating area. Um, so that, that, yeah, I think it's interesting. Uh, Carl had a, his hand up, has that gone away? Well, I, I guess more a language issue in dealing with them. Um, kind of uh, phrases and stuff that are used to uh, obfuscate typical uh, uh, sensors and such, you know, it seems like, there's, so I didn't know, you know, in terms of you're trying to soften language, you know, how rapid you would have to respond to this type of uh, uh, changes. And Yeah, that's a really important question. And, you know, when you're, when, when you're talking to another person and they start looking down and they start, you know, kind of their eyes start drooping or whatever. There's a lot of things that happen slowly. Uh, there's other things that happen very rapidly. Um, and uh, in conversation, some of the rapid responses you give feedback are too rapid and can be um, difficult for the speaker to respond to because the person is making those responses is, is a little bit, um, yeah, a little bit uh, too jump, jumps too quickly, um, jumps in too quickly. But it's a complicated question. Um, how, how, what, because we've been dealing with, you know, there's certain things you can tell very quickly and there's other things you can't. And if you look at the closed captions, maybe below you today, you'll see that the last couple words, the closed captions is playing with those last couple words, trying to figure out that sentence. And it takes, it takes, it doesn't figure it out right away, nor do we when we're listening sometimes. Mike Worth writes, and he's unfortunately in a, a, a noisy environment, so he asked me to read aloud for him. He's saying context awareness is a big deal for us. Military trainees spend a long time learning about situation, situational awareness, which I suspect is much the same thing. And in all of these domains, making connections is ubiquitous. And thus the combinatorial complexity is enormous. So how do we go from toy problems, constrained environments with a few connections to examine to real world environments? So that's a, there's, there's a lot of things in that statement. First thing I wanna say is I'm a, I'm a card carrying conscious objector and I do not work on military problems. But that has nothing to do with this question. Um, right. <laughs> um, I like situational awareness when you're uh, uh, walking uh, on a hiking trail or something. Um, but um, uh, the, the thing that's interesting to me is um, in AI, there are some very hard problems. And the, on, the alternate, on the other hand, uh, social, uh, socially appropriate feedback is a simpler problem because um, people's tone and whether or not to speak um, and, and how to be uh, affirming and not, not uh, discouraging those aren't as hard of, of things to come up with. Um, and I just was, I mean, yesterday I was uh, at a ski area, actually, it was a very nice day. Um, and uh, there was, as I was coming off of the, the ski lift, there was this guy just standing there, a young employee, and he's saying, uh-huh, uh-huh. He said it to every single person. In other words, this is a fantastic day. You're gonna, you're gonna like have a wonderful time. There's 40 inches of brand new powder out here. And you know, he was being, he, it was contextually, you knew where you were. You're at the top of a very fancy ski lift at a very fancy ski area on the very special day. And he was just saying, enjoy it. Um, so he didn't need feedback from us. He knew 
who he was speaking to and what the effect of his communication was to be was going to be, which was to affirm a very obvious uh, known known ex uh, experience that we were all in part of. It wasn't a toy problem. I mean, it is play skiing, but. So, uh, Brandel, you have another comment? Uh, yeah, so uh, you uh, mentioned that you use a uh, sort of Blackboard, uh, a, a Blackboard uh, conflict resolution response thing to determine, I'm guessing, a single response at a given moment. Um, is it, how, have you tried giving multiple and potentially conflicting responses? And, and what, what kind of uh, impact do the two sort of approaches have? Oh, that's an interesting question. Yeah, I mean, you take a look at the thespian, um, you know, model where there's the smile and the and the frown going on, and um, uh, it's really it's really, you know, fraught to communicate um, complexity to people. Um, people, and that that's, you know, um, and some people some people can deal with it, but. Um, it's, and, and I'm, I want to so badly because there's always something positive and negative about every single thing there, you know, I'm, that's, that's the way my mind works anyways, nothing's completely perfect or, or broken. And so I, you know, I think it's a very, very interesting topic. I'm just checking the chat one more time. Yeah, well. And I want to say uh, that we had several, Steve, let me know that we had uh, several people watching on YouTube side, you know, in simultaneity with us, although they couldn't interact with us because we're not monitoring comments over there. Oh, really? Well, that's good. Thank you, everybody, for yeah. watching. So you already had a more audience than you thought. Thanks, everybody, for showing up tonight. Uh, next month, another fabulous program in J January. Have a wonderful holiday season, and we'll see you after the new year. And tell all your friends, show up at Bay Kai's second Tuesday of the month. Good night, everyone.